Well, in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25, it says this, Just then a religious scholar stood before Jesus in order to test his doctrines. He posed this question, Teacher, what requirement must I fulfill if I want to live forever in heaven? And Jesus replied, What does Moses teach us? What do you read in the law? The religious scholar answered, It states, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your passion, all your energy, and your every thought. And you must love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. Jesus said, that is correct. Now go and do exactly that and you will live. Wanting to justify himself, he questioned Jesus further saying, what do you mean by my neighbor? You know, much of Jesus' ministry was spent talking about loving your neighbors, serving your neighbors, forgiving your neighbors. And this religious scholar, he hears this from Jesus in this moment. He says, okay, okay, that sounds good. But who exactly is my neighbor? The, the message paraphrase says that he asked this question looking for a loophole. Like, are, are there certain people that I can love and certain people that maybe I don't have to love? What does this look like? Who, who is actually my neighbor? You know, I think we can relate to this because sometimes I think loving people sounds great until you actually start thinking about certain people, you know, people that can be difficult to love. And to this question, Jesus doesn't give a quick answer to this self-serving question. Instead, he launches into a really... Um, long parable, an, an anecdote. And he goes like this. He says, there was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho on this really common, really famous road that many people traveled by. So they, they immediately would be able to imagine this story and this narrative. Jesus doesn't specify the man's race, the man who's traveling, but he was talking to a group of Jews. And it can be assumed as we progress through the story that this was a Jewish man. So the man was traveling and all of a sudden he is attacked. He's beaten, he's mugged, all of his things, including his clothes, are taken from him. So he's left sitting there and he's half dead and he's half naked. And it's assumed in this story that if this man is not helped, he's going to die. And so Jesus continues in Luke 10, verse 31. He says, soon a Jewish priest was walking down the same road and came upon the wounded man. And I think the, the listeners would have thought this is, this is good news. Not only is this a fellow Jew, but this is a priest who's coming up and and. Surely he's going to help this guy. He's got to help him. The modern day equivalent with this would be if a pastor walked up on this man, a fellow Christian, this pastor walks up and, you know, people would be thinking, oh, thank God, it's Pastor Brandon. Of course, he's going to help him. And as Jesus continues on, though, it says that this Jewish priest walking down the same road came upon the wounded man and seeing him from a distance, the priest crossed to the other side of the road and walked right past him, not turning to help him one bit. I think the people in this moment listening would have been shocked, honestly. There would have been a collective gasp in the room as far as this moment, you know, thinking this is the man that's going to help him. And they maybe thought, okay, well, he's just having an off day. You know, this priest, he's got places to go. You know, he's an important man. So then Jesus continues in verse 32 and he says, later a religious man, a Levite, who was a, an assistant to a priest, he comes walking up. Like, man, this is, a, this is a fortunate man who's on the road. I mean, he had a lot of unfortunate moments, but now people are coming up that can help him. The Levite shows up. He comes walking down the same road and likewise crossed to the other side to pass by the wounded man without stopping to help him. You know, it's really easy, I think, to cast severe judgment on these guys. I think I do it every time I read this story. I look at this priest, I look at this Levite, and I'm like, how in the world could you walk by a man that's on the ground? He's, he's obviously been beaten up. He's probably not gonna make it if you don't help him. And how could you just walk to the other side of the road, not even get close to this guy and not help him? Honestly, I think these guys probably had some pretty good excuses, to be real. I, I bet they had good reasons, at least in their mind, for why they wouldn't help this man. And honestly, I bet that we look more like them more often than we would ever like to admit. How many times do we have the ability to help someone, to love them the way that Jesus loves us, yet we, in the same way, walk right by? You know, we make excuses. And, and I think this, I think there will always be a reason to not help someone. You will always be able to formulate a reason to not love someone the way that Christ loves us. And you might have good reasons. They might be good excuses. And I just want to talk about a couple of those right now. Just two, two excuses I think are really common and maybe two excuses that this priest and Levite would have had in this moment 2,000 years ago from Jesus' parable. And the first excuse is simply this. I don't have enough 
time. And I don't know how many times you've felt that in your life. I think I say that almost every day. I don't have enough time. You know, there's a really fascinating story. Um, years ago, a professor at a seminary had his students study the ins and outs of the parable of the Good Samaritan. They went in depth for a semester. They were studying this story, looking at every aspect. They were then given the assignment toward the end of this segment to write a sermon about the Good Samaritan. Write this sermon from the book of Luke. A story of what it looks like to love your neighbor, to help those in need, to love like Christ. Now here's what's crazy, that when the day came to preach, the students were to meet their professor for a few moments in his office. They were gonna talk about the sermon and then he would send them to walk across the street over to where the chapel was, where they would deliver their sermon. Before leaving, by random chance, the students were given three different scenarios. The first scenario, the student was told by the professor they had plenty of time. They were actually early, but you know what? Why don't you head over? Okay, you got a lot of time. The second group, uh, they were told that you're running on time, but you should probably head over now so you're not late. You have a little bit of time, but not a ton. And the third group was told you're running late. Like, you got to go. Get over there. Get to the chapel. You got to preach that sermon. The people are going to be waiting for you. But the crazy thing is the whole situation was rigged. This was a study the students had no idea that they were a part of. And on the way over... Each student would be confronted by a homeless man in severe need, laying in the middle of an alleyway that they had to pass through. And this alley was only four feet wide. So, so essentially what happened is these students would have to help him or would have to literally step over him to go and preach a story on the love of Jesus and this good Samaritan. The study revealed something pretty significant uh, of the feeling of a time constraint. So here's the thing, 65% of the students that were early stopped to help the man, which still is not high enough in my opinion, that still reveals a problem. But 65% of the students that were early stopped, they helped the man, they tried to tend to his needs. 45% of the students who were on time, they stopped to offer help. Now here's where this jumps, only 10% of the ones running late offered any form of assistance. The study revealed something really profound and it's this, that margin matters. If you don't have margin in your life, if you're always feeling constantly busy and rushed everywhere you go, you're over packing your schedule, you don't have margin. And if you don't have margin, you're not gonna see the people that God is calling you to help and God is calling you to reach there everywhere. Every single day you are encountering people that require the love of Christ, that require your help and your assistance. And in this hurried 21st century, we don't have time. So the reality is that we have to make time. You don't have it. No one's going to give you time. You don't have more time than anybody else in human history or anybody who's alive right now. So we have to intentionally make time. I heard somebody say this one time and I thought it was profound that hurry and love are incompatible. Think about anybody you're trying to love in your life. And if it's always hurried and rushed, that's not really love. You're not giving your time, your attention, your focus. We have to intentionally create margin in our lives. And here's the thing, your margin can be someone else's miracle. Just by you creating space, you're creating the ability for the Holy Spirit to work through you and the love of Jesus to shine through. So because you decided to make some space, you'll now be able to make a difference. And so how many of us are in that boat? I don't have time. And maybe we're not helping people because we're overpacking our schedule. And the other excuse is, is just this, I just don't have the energy. So we don't have time. And I think a lot of the time, because we don't have time, because we're over busy, we're over hurried, we live in this frantic, time in our, in our world, now we say, well, I just don't have the energy. I don't know if you ever thought this before, but I have my own problems. I've got a lot of them. I have people that need me. I've got a family. I have financial issues. There's just so many things happen. I have my own issues and trying to carry someone else's. The thought of that is just too much, right? You, you get that phone call or that text from somebody that like might be like on the verge of needy. And you're just like, oh my gosh, like I just feel suffocated by people right now. And this is exactly what I believe Jesus is challenging in this story. It's, it feels so heavy sometimes, the idea of adding someone else's burden to a life where you already have your own. Two things I think the Bible shows us about this idea of not having the energy, because I think we've all been there. The first thing is this, though. Okay, understand this, that when it comes to helping people, no matter if you have the time or the energy, the first thing is that we are called and commanded to help people. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens. It doesn't just say carry your own burdens. It says carry each other's. Invite other people in and say, I'm here to walk with you. I'm here to carry this with you. And look how this finishes. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ was love God and love people. And he's basically saying, Paul to the Galatian church, that if you will carry others' burdens, that's the greatest fulfillment of loving God and loving people. 
We have to link arms with people. We have to know what's happening in their life so we can help them carry. But the second thing is this, and it's an incredible promise in scripture. God will supernaturally replenish you if you do. It's a promise. We're gonna need the Lord's help. If you're gonna not just carry your own, but other people's burdens, you're gonna need God's help. And I love this promise from Proverbs 11. It says, those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. And that's counterintuitive in our human thinking that doesn't make sense. It literally makes no sense, but that's what God's saying. This is a spiritual principle. But if you will go and you will give your time, and you will carry others' burdens, and you will reach out, and you, you will decide, I want to know what's going on in people's lives, and you will help them through these moments. He said, I will give you a supernatural refreshment. Yeah, your outward body might be tired at times, but I'm gonna restore your soul, and through a refreshed and restored soul, it will actually bring more energy to your physical body. It's amazing how the spiritual and the natural can work together. And so I don't have time. I, I, I have my own problems. These are excuses that they had back, I think, 2,000 years ago. It's excuses that we have today. But Jesus continues in the parable. And he continues by saying, then a Samaritan comes along. And this is an incredible plot twist. I don't have all the time in the world to get into this. But, but Jewish people and, and the Samaritan people, they were sworn enemies. Sworn enemies. There was racial tension, religious disagreement. And that was just the beginning, just the surface. And honestly, this should have been the bad guy in the story. I think everyone listening, the Samaritan, if anybody else was telling this, this would be the villain. But Jesus makes him the hero, which I think is just the most Jesus thing of all time. He loved to shock people and show people your thinking is completely wrong. And it's been wrong for a long time. In Luke 10, 33, he says, Then this, this despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, probably knowing this is a Jewish man that maybe wouldn't help him if the situation was reversed, says he saw the man. And here's the difference. The others, when they saw him, what did they do? Walked away. He says he felt compassion for him. He says, and now going over to him, he felt compassion. That word compassion literally means to be moved to one's core, to feel the pain of another, which is empathy, right? Do you have empathy toward people? Do you feel the pain of other people? Are you moved to your core when somebody's hurting? And it was that compassion that caused him to actually go over to the man because true compassion will always lead to action. If it's true compassion, it will always lead you to action. So understand this, the priest and the Levite, they created space when they saw the man. They, saw, they thought, I've gotta, I've gotta keep a distance between, between myself and this person so that I don't actually have to get close and see them as a person. Because when you stay far away, you can just see a problem, but when you get close, you begin to see a person. So they create space while the Samaritan closes the gap. The Samaritan decides, I'm gonna get close. I see somebody that's in need. I have compassion, I'm gonna go over to them. And this is important because distance, distance creates indifference, but proximity brings perspective. So when we remain far away from issues, we don't have to deal with issues. We don't have to handle issues. We can, we can keep them far away in our minds. The empathy is not there. The compassion is not there. But when we are proximate, when we are close, we gain a new perspective. And we, not, we begin to not only see problems, but we see people who are experiencing problems. When we get close, we gain, we gain clarity. And that's that clarity that helps us to love people. So this is, this is what I find interesting. All three of these men cross the road, the, the scripture tells us. They cross the road, but for different reasons. And I just want to ask you today a simple question. Why do you cross the road in your own life? Do you cross the road to get away from need, to walk on the other side, or do you cross the road to draw near to need? And I have to be honest, loving people can be incredibly inconvenient. I think loving in this way that Jesus is challenging us to love will probably be the most inconvenient thing that you do in your life. It's not always time effective. It's, it's not always the most time uh, effective thing that you can do. It will take your time. It will take your energy. It will take your resources. It's not always convenient. But I look at this man, it, the story goes on and he, he shows up and he pours his own oil on the wounds of this man. He pours out his own wine on his wounds. He bandages him up. He puts him on his own donkey. He walks into an inn, which could have been miles away. When we hear this story, like he took him to an inn. It's like the inn wasn't just around the, the corner. It could have been six miles in either direction. He pays for his room. He continues to care for him. Then he tells the innkeeper to take track of the payments until the man is better and he'll pay the rest on his way back when he comes back through. And Luke 10, 36 says, Jesus says this. So now tell me which of the three men who saw the wounded man pr tr proved to be the true neighbor? Which of them proved to be the true neighbor? And the religious scholar responded, the one who demonstrated kindness and mercy. And Jesus said, you must go and do the same. 
We have been recipients of the love and the grace and the help of Jesus in our own life. It's now our call and commission to go and do the same for others. And it gets messy. It's not always convenient, but it is the greatest call we have as believers. Let's respond to that call. And my challenge to you today is this. Now you must go and do likewise.